Hi, uh, my name is Ian Burrell. I'm a software engineer at Rentrack, and this doesn't have anything to do with my job. It's just a hobby and something I'm interested in. Um, so what is IPv6? It's the new internet protocol. If you can call something, it's 15 years old. New, and its main thing is it makes the addresses 128 bits long. Um, and the reason for this is IPv4 only has 32-bit addresses. So there are about 4 billion possible addresses, which is a problem when there are 7 billion people on the planet and there are estimates that there may be 50 billion uh, devices online in five, 10 years. And this has become a much more serious problem recently because they've actually started allocating the final uh, IPv4 blocks. So back in 2011, the international uh, organization gave out the last blocks to the regional re registries. And then the Asia and Europe registries ran out fairly shortly thereafter. And North America is predicted to allocate the last block next year sometime. And the result will basically be an address shortage in which it will be hard to acquire IP addresses. Um, it's quite likely they'll start costing money. And there'll be a market for IP addresses from people who aren't using theirs to people who really need theirs. And probably the biggest effect is it'll be hard to start a company or organization that needs to use lots of IP addresses like an ISP. Uh, what are the results of this will be what's called carrier grade NAT, where ISPs give out private IP addresses. And the result of this is you'll end up with double translation between your local NAT on your router and theirs. It's unlikely you'll be able to forward ports through it. And it makes P2P programs really hard to get working. Uh, some other advantages of IPv6 gives you end-to-end -end connectivity. Everyone should have a routable uh, address and be reachable. Um, it allows for more efficient routing in that the networks will be assigned hierarchically. So you know, theoretically, all of North America be in one prefix. Uh, another big one is you, it simplifies network configuration because addresses are assigned automatically. Uh, the other, two, other two are more theoretical features in that you can uh, you know, route streams to people who subscribe to them, and it has IPsec built in, which should make fire, uh, VPNs and things a little easier to get working. Uh, so IPv6 addresses are a 16-byte number, sort of hard to remember, so they write them in hex in groups separated by colons and usually remove the leading zeros and replace any runs, uh, a run of zeros. Uh, so in IPv6, uh, the default subnet is 64 bits long. So sort of half of it is subnet, and uh, half of it is network, and half of it is interface identifier. And ISPs should give customers uh, slash 56 or slash 48 so they can do their local subnetting. A uh, big part is automatic address assignment. So basically, the routers give out the network prefix. And then each machine uses its local MAC address to come up with its uh, address. Uh, so current status of IPv6 is two years ago, a bunch of sites and networks rolled out live support for it. It's currently about 1% of global traffic. It's about 3.5% of traffic to Google, which does IPv6. Uh, more importantly, the traffic is doubling every year. A uh, bunch of ISPs are supporting it. Surprising to say, you know, Comcast is doing something well, but they probably have the most penetration of any ISP. Um, and then also a lot of mobile operators are doing IPv6 for their LTE deployments. Uh, a bunch of major sites are using IPv6, such as Google and Facebook. Um, so the main principles for uh, programming with IPv6 is to stop hard coding IPv4 and then also use sort of protocol agnostic code. And finally, use the high level language support when it's available. So, in the uh, old socket API, you hard code the protocol as a constant. For IPv4, it's AFI net. And then use sort of a socket, you know, an address structure that's specific to that. 
Now you theoretically can support IPv6 by just changing all the constants to AF INET 6 and using a different address structure. Uh, the problem with that is we're going to run dual stack for a very long time and machines will have both v4 and v6 addresses. Um, also, you know, your OS could not have IP, support IPv6. That usually happens with when it's compiled out. Um, and another big one is IPv6 connection could not work. That's major, it's mainly a problem with uh, tunnels or when they're routing problems. So the solution for that is you basically get a list of both v4 and v6 addresses, and then you try to connect to each one and you know, use the first one that works. And these are ordered by connectivity rules. So it'll, try, it'll do uh, public IPv6 first, v4, and then final uh, tunneled IPv6, which is the least reliable. Um, and the function that does this is called get adder info. Um, you can speci when you specify the protocol as unspec, and you know, it'll use either one. Um, and it does all kinds of different things with specifying hints and things, but this is sort of the basic way to do it. And then you go through all of the addresses in turn and connect to each one. And the structure specifies the protocol and an agnostic way. Um, so IPv6 support replaces a lot of um, syscalls. For example, you shouldn't use INET A2N anymore. You should use INET P2N instead. You know, similarly, don't use get host by name, get, use get address info. Luckily, this makes it relatively easy to search through the old uh, functions in your code and replace them with something nicer. <coughs> Sorry. Things are a little more complicated with, when you're listening to uh, when you're writing servers. And there is a concept called IPv4 mapped addresses where they map IPv4 into the IPv6 state. Uh, space and uh, v6 sockets can actually receive v4 um, connections. Uh, the problem with that is you end up with security issues where the code doesn't really know how to deal with those mapped addresses. You know, filtering stuff isn't really set up to work with them. Uh, another big problem is the defaults are different between OSs in terms of whether the support is enabled or not. Um, and the result of this you frequently see is the bind will fail when the address is in use because you know, it gets confused about which one is listening to uh, the addresses. And the solution to this is just use separate v4 and v6 sockets. Just keep the, them as separate as possible. And then on the v6 socket, enable the um, v6 only option. Um, so get adder info can be used to get a list of addresses to listen to. Um, if you specify the host as null and the flags as uh, AI passive, it will give you the addresses for basically listening on all addresses. And you end up with a similar for loop to go through the list of addresses to bind to each socket. And the main complexity with this is once you are done, then you have to you know, use select to you know, listen to each of the addresses, uh, or to each of the sockets. Um, so for dynamic language support, the things to look out for are you want the socket API to uh, support v6. Um, you want a high level interface that actually does the dual protocol support for you. And finally, you want the standard library to be updated to use hopefully the high level interface, but if not, you know, the agnostic support. So Java has supported v6 since 1.4, and you just use you know, the socket object. Uh, Python has had a convenience uh, function called create connection since 2.6. Uh, in Ruby, the uh, TCP socket, TCP server ones uh, do uh, dual protocol support automatically. Uh, unfortunately, Perl is probably in the worst shape. The, uh, socket module only got v6 support integrated in 514 uh, a couple years ago. And there are two higher level classes, IOSocket INET and IOSocket INET 6, that do v4 and v6 exclusively. 
and the new module that does both of them together called IO socket IP was only added in 520 last month. And so the problem is most of CPAN then uses IO socket INET directly and can only do V4. Yeah. Um, so you're saying that to use both, or your recommendation was to use both the V4 and the V6 socket. Can they share a point? Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so my suggestion in Perl is just start using IO socket IP and you know, adding it as a dependency and forcing it to be installed. And hopefully things will get sorted out in the core soon. Um, there are a bunch of other issues you have to deal with in code, mainly because v6 addresses are, you know, break some of the assumptions that a lot of code has about addresses. Um, a big one is v6 addresses are hard to remember and type because they're long. And they're also automatically created, which means um, <clears throat> it's much easier if you use host names and try not to ever type out addresses. <laughs> um, so you want to update DNS dynamically. Um, you also want to use service discovery. Um, uh, so you can use DNS for service discovery, but there are also systems that sort of when a machine goes down immediately, you know, uh, no, to, you know, take it out of the pool for connecting to. Uh, so there's a protocol that for DynDN called DynDNS where the machine can tell the DNS server to update. Uh, the other way to do it is, you know, through a configuration management uh, system. Uh, mainly for you know when you're assigning machines and things. Uh, for sort of external services, yeah, you probably want to use a static address for all of that. Yeah, and uh, one of the suggestions would actually be to use for pretty much any external service, assign a static IP address. I'm more thinking for if you have a you know cluster of machines and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, another big issue is since v6 uh, addresses contain a colon, you can't use it to separate in the format, so they usually wrap them in brackets and use that for both specifying host import and uh, URLs. Uh, problem is you, there's a lot of code that does something like this and just splits on the colon and that no longer works. Um, another problem is there's some normalization issues with the addresses, whether they have zeros or not, and it makes it hard to compare them as strings. Uh, so one question is, you said that you can leave out strings and zeros. How do you know, I can see leaving out, leaving out pre, uh, prefix zeros, but how do you know how many zeros are in each chain non-zero characters? Uh, you can by just counting the number of, you know, uh, stuff that is left. Um, It's not any string of zeros. It's sort of the longest string in the middle. And it's because you usually have a prefix and then a static uh, number. And so there's a long run in there. Um, another one is there's a lot of code that uses regexes to match um, addresses. And it's much harder to do, with, uh, do properly with v6. Um, so main solution is use higher level modules or classes for uh, matching and parsing addresses, or alternatively, just do them as binary um, addresses. So another big problem is storage of addresses. Since v4 addresses fit in integers, lots of people just store them in integers, and that doesn't work for v6 addresses that are four times as long. Uh, so it's best to store them in binary format makes them easier to uh, compare and work with. In MySQL, storm in a var binary 16, Postgres actually has a built-in type called inet that stores uh, both v4 and v6 addresses. Um, so what the future looks like is that there's going to be more and more v6 uh, networks and things. 
but for a very long time, it'll you know be dual stacked. There'll be, you have both v6 and v4. Um, however, v v4 will be more and more be private IP addresses and NAT and stuff, and hopefully v6 will be used for sort of more direct access and newer deployments. Um, finally, here are some ways that you can actually um, help out uh, with doing it. One is uh, enable v6 at home. Um, a lot of ISPs have v6 support, but you have to get your con router configured to be using it. Um, the other one is it's good to add it onto your website. It can be relatively easy to add v6 um, on your front end web servers, still use v4 internally. Uh, also, there are CDNs that do v6 and can proxy it for you. Um, one thing I was discovered is there's a lot of old information about the old way of doing sockets and a lot of the problems with v6 and the new ways of doing it just need to be documented um, better. And finally, test out and fix your software. It's, you know, probably have some time to do it, but it's, you know, there's a lot of things to be fixed and to work on and it's uh, good to get started now. Um, also, open source has a big advantage for this in that you can actually, you know, change the software and fix it. Um, open source has also been a big leader in getting IPv6 support. It, I, my understanding is that BSD and Linux were some of the first operating systems to have it available. Um, and then another part is my feeling is that uh, IPv6 is an important part for uh, an open internet. It means that addresses are uh, plentiful and free instead of costing money and only available to the people who already got them. Uh, everything, you know, gets a routable address and is sort of equal in terms of the network. And then finally, you know, everyone can have lots of devices. You don't have to worry about how many devices are, you know, in your house or in the subnet. And it's quite likely there'll be lots and lots of devices in the future. Um, and so the Internet Society and the World IPv6 launch guys have some good resources about it. All right, uh, questions? Yeah, that's uh, my impression is that sort of with the uh, world IPv6 launch uh, two years ago, pretty much all the routing issues got worked out. So if you can get it, it tends to work, you know. Is, yeah, um, people do use tunneling just if their ISP doesn't support it. Right. But yeah, hopefully in the next few years we'll get to a point where you can actually use only IPv6, you know, reliably. Because now there's just a lot of things that you can't access. Uh, it actually looks like it's higher in the U.S. just because the uh, U.S. ISPs I mentioned have been more aggressive in deploying it. Yeah, one of the interesting things if you look at the uh, traffic graphs is they all spike on the weekends because everyone, you know, the home ISPs have been much better about rolling it out than the ones that companies use. Uh, yeah, there are actually quite a few, you know, there are quite a few of them there, and there actually are ones for internal use only, and they, in fact, the sort of, the block that they're assigning of is a fairly small section of the total address space. Yeah, the, what the browsers have started doing is a thing called Happy Eyeballs. They actually do both V4 and V6 in parallel and use whatever one comes out first. Um, unfortunately, that's a little hard to implement in a lot of software without sort of parallel uh, support. Um, my understanding is V6 routing has gotten much better such that 
if it actually has an address, you're, you know, you're likely to be able to reach it. Yeah, it, and my impression is now these days routers either don't support it or they, it, it or it works. Uh, yeah, they are. Um, and I'm actually not ha all that familiar with how they are allocating them. It sounds like they're much more generous in terms of the allocation size. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it lets me know, like, hey, you're accessing like, this over IPv6. They're like, cool, I'm going to teach that. Do you notice any difference in the OS, I guess, processing? I'm thinking, like, let's say you're doing cases that jump on people and research with it. Should I be using that more of a process? Uh, no. Uh, my understanding is, you know, for operating systems, it doesn't make much difference. And then, the hardware has gotten uh, fast enough that it might be a little bit slower, but not much. Yeah, the, and my understanding is these sort of larger addresses offset by being it, they align things to be a little more efficient to process. So, but, yeah, a big part of it is just computers have gotten you know, lots faster. Oh, it's showing the difference one for the main page and then for all the sort of extra stuff it loads. Like, you frequently notice that, you know, most sites, you know, are on IPv4, but the Google Analytics is always v6, so. Yeah, there is, because you're, yeah, you're, you normally would leak it, you know, in sort of every connection. There are uh, privacy extensions that basically you come up with a random, you know, uh, address for it. And my understanding is most of the OSs are doing it by default now. I definitely have noticed, I definitely noticed on Mac that they'll actually have both the Mac address and the random one assigned, and then it will change it every, you know, few things. But and the V6, you know, local space is so enormous that, you know, <laughs> you probably could do a new one for every connection and, you know, thing. Yeah, and, well, in so, and in some ways it's not any different than V4 in that the, you know, the prefix is given to you by the ISP and so they can, you know, identify your house anyway, so... Yeah, it's yeah. Definitely, the, it's definitely an issue, and, and and the solution really is just actually just uh, you know have a firewall in front of them, and probably the biggest problem is since V6 is new, I guess a lot of the firewalls you know aren't as you know well tested and well set up as they will, but you know they'll you know get worked on <laughs> hopefully before. You know, your refrigerator is accessible to the outside. Um, and then probably the other nice thing about V6 is you could actually make your refrigerator accessible to the outside if you wanted to. And it's less, it's less about your, you know, refrigerator, but more, you know, you could actually... <laughs>
Yeah, and the solution for that is less make things inaccessible and make sure you just can't do that. Right. Better design. Or for the or for the <laughs> nope, I guess I ran through them pretty fast. <laughs> We're not going over. But.